So here we are. Welcome back, everyone. Um, we're going to start with music, but I asked um, one of our, another one of our elders who is here um, to, to start us off with a blessing and her, um, her wisdom with us this morning. Um, Yvonne Delk, Professor Delk, if you would please start us off right now. It is a blessing to be in this space. It is a blessing for me, having come from parents who believed that it was possible that a new day that did not have to confront racism, sexism, classism, divisions, fragmentation. I'm the daughter of a grave digger and a mama who worked in other people's kitchen, but I'm also a daughter of Africa. I have never forgotten that I am connected to a people who were strong in the spirit, who were strong in their understanding of community. I keep before me the words umbute. I am because you are. And because you are, I can be also. I greet you as an elder in the 78th year of my life and the 50th year of ministry. And I come standing on the shoulders of so many who have fought for peace and justice and wholeness in our land. Those who have come from every part of our globe who have fought for peace, for justice, who have given their lives for peace and justice. And so I am here among you. We who believe in freedom cannot rest until it comes. We who believe in justice will not rest until it comes. And so I invoke the power of the Spirit upon us. I invoke the power of the Spirit upon us that has the ability to move in every heart, every mind, every soul. The Spirit that can unite us the spirit that can renew us, the spirit that can restore us to be able to pledge our commitment to work for every girl, every man, every woman, the freedom to live in a world of justice and wholeness and peace together, together our voices can be heard. And so I am more than honored to be in this space with you, President Carter. For many of us, you represented that symbol coming from the South as we came from the South, understanding the struggle as we struggle. We stood with pride as you served as our president of these United States of America and even more so with pride as we've watched your witness year in and year out, showing us and carving out the pathway to peace. And so we invoke God's blessings upon you as well. Let us bow. Spirit of God, breath of God, energy of God, passion of God, love of God, courage of God, fall fresh on us, 
fall fresh on our work this day and tomorrow. And may we leave here with the call in our hearts, but the determination in our minds to connect with one another as we continue to work against oppression wherever it is, against the demonization and objecting of people wherever they are. May your spirit enable us and our spirits to rise like a mighty wind blowing peace and justice and wholeness where it will. We offer this prayer in your spirit, in your love, and in your hope. We the people say amen and amen. Thank you. We're pretty good at starting meetings, I think. <laughs> Thank you, Yvonne, that was perfect. We appreciate your blessing and needed it. And now we are really honored to welcome back our band, the Universal Spirits, um, who will be now joined by someone you all might know, uh, a renowned artist, Grace Potter, will grace us with her voice.
I just need to point out that Grace came here from tour. She flew in this morning to be here with us and is going right back to tour. And the same with some of the, many of these musicians that came here to share this music with you. Oh, wait a second. Wait a second. Grace, where are you? I think we have a birthday girl. Ready? Happy birth! Oh, wait a minute. Two birthdays. Stand up. Come here. Stand up, Grace. Two birthdays. We have to acknowledge. Happy birthday, dear Grace and Samar. Happy birthday to you. Thank you so much. So aren't we mean because we have this great music and then we uh, ask you to calm down your heart rate and uh, get back into deep conversation? Are we ready for it though? We are? <laughs> That's okay, take that vibration. You know, my son always tells me we have to get on the right frequency to have this kind of conversation and I think we're there. So I'm gonna ask um, the moderator of our next discussion Sanam Anderlini to guide us um, in the next conversation. And I just want to say that Sanam is a wonderful partner to the Carter Center. Uh, we met her, speaking of elders, we, we met Sanam through the elders. 
and uh, we have just really come up with a wonderful collaboration, and so we're grateful to her for helping us lead this next discussion. Thank you. It's a, truly a pleasure and an honor to be here. Thank you, President Carter, for hosting us. Um, I, before I start, I just want to say that the Carter Center is an extraordinarily unique space for all of us uh, in this country um, at this moment, and actually I think in the world, in terms of uh, giving us the freedom and, this, and the opportunity and the safety to be able to speak about really, really serious issues, and specifically about the role of the US, the good and the not so good of the US in the world. So thank you very much for that. And I've reached a point in my life where I, I've started saying that those of us who have, for those of us who have it, freedom of expression is a responsibility. Um, and I think we have to raise our voices. So thank you for providing us with that um, space. Uh, I'm the co-founder of the International Civil Society Action Network and the Women's Alliance for um, Security Leadership. Many of our partners are here. Um, and in our work with women around the world, specifically dealing with conflict and extremism, the issue of economics at the roots of what's happening has been coming up. So it was wonderful to be able to have the, the discussion uh, two days ago around economics of peace and economics of extremism. And as I said the other day, uh, so much of the violence and the militarism and, and extremism that we are familiar with or the media picks up on these days is around identity-based extremism. But actually, I think we need to turn our eyes to economic extremism or extreme capitalism, as, as I call it. Um, because when you have a world, and just, just to remind us all, this year, 62 people in the world have as much wealth as 50% of the population of the entire world. And, um, and it kind of makes us reminisce 2010 when 388 people in the world had 50% of, of the wealth. Of their, so it's actually, you know, it's getting fewer and fewer. Um, so this extremity is, 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 is really uh, getting out of control. And there's no trickle down, as, 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 as you all said. So um, in that context, what are we dealing with? And, and one, when we see that there's a vacuum left in terms of education and health, and Robina mentioned earlier about not being able to afford school books. In fact, why are we even having to pay for school books and, and, and school in, in many of the countries we live in? Uh, the, the va that vacuum is being filled by others, and they come with their own ideology, which is often extreme. And then our state's reactions has been militarized. So our money is going towards militarized responses, which then means that we have a devastation in terms of our health and education and other infrastructure. And it's this very negative um, sort of cycle that, 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 that we're in. But there is an answer. And I think that, that this panel or the conversation that we had the other day and, and we can't continue today um, shows us that while the problems are many, the solutions also exist in very, very practical ways. Um, so I wanted to open uh, the, the, the conversation. We will start with our colleague, uh, Thomas Membreno from Honduras, who, you, um, who joined us recently. Uh, he's a general coordinator of the Civic Council for Popular Indigenous Organizations. Work. He, he was a colleague of Berta Caseras. And we wanted to um, ask you, Thomas, to talk about what you see on Honduras in terms of the extractive industries and what that is doing um, to, to the world. And then I will uh, ask my colleague, Radhika Balakrishnan, to, to lead the conversation. But the floor is yours, Thomas. Thank you. Bueno, muchísimas gracias. Gracias, eh, Presidente Jimmy Carter. Well, thank you very much, President Jimmy Carter. Thank you to all of you for being here in, in this important space for discussion, but also uh, proposals so that in the world there should be respect for human rights as, pop, as populations, as indigenous peoples, and as the main center, we know that it is the human being, and also there's the topic of development. For us, as indigenous people, as, a, as Copin, as a Lenca people, we think that it is very fundamental within human rights to speak 
of all the policies that have been implemented in our territories. And that these policies, we have seen that they respond to political and economic interests in our countries. That every time, more and more, this goes to the detriment of what are what constitutes rights. Every time, more and more, when there are these policies of uh, concessions and privatizations of m mines and hydroelectric projects in indigenous territories, we lose the right uh, as a people and as persons. So because of that, I think it's important that as a population who defends the rights of indigenous people, or defend the rights of humanity, it is important to see what these policies of structural adjustments are and what they have to do with the concessions granted to our territories. It's also important to see as a whole the uh, integrity and the integration of human rights. We know that there can not be any type of criminalization or any type of concessions that would deteriorate the rights of the indigenous communities or of the people. It's important to mention as well that rights as human beings we know that and their whole and the whole topic of concessions have been having gathering and putting together all those structures I can speak of our country Honduras in which we have seen that the topic of private enterprise and politics has been taking over all the decision-making structures in our country. For example, if we talk about justice, if we talk about legislation, and we talk about the executive as well, we see that the greatest impact, the greatest impact, which is really striking human rights, is in the territories where wealth lies, wealth that has to do with water, with all the common goods of nature, such as forests and the minerals that exist in our indigenous communities. We have also seen that based on that, more than 35% of the Honduran territory is being granted out in concessions. Um, this means that for the indigenous population, for the Honduran people, this, we will see more criminalization and and murders of of of, com, of, of colleagues uh, and indigenous colleagues will continue. These are colleagues who stri uh, struggle to defend our territories. It's also important to mention within this environment this whole topic that has to do with the uh, uh, elimination uh, of people. We have to see what this has to do with the topics. Uh, that deal with how we can break or what we can do as defenders of our people. For example, we always see that the topic of concessions goes hand in hand with m militarization in our territories. And we know that militarization has an important, has a characteristic that's important to mention here. They can go with total impunity anywhere in our territories that they want to, to commit their, their, their crimes, such as in the cases that we have been presenting as a Lenka people, or what has happened to us recently with our, 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 our colleague Berta Cáceres. I'm going to focus on that because it's a very important topic for our people. First, there's the Aguasarca hydroelectric project. We know that there has been no, no free and informed uh, prior consultation, and the Honduran people ha have not cared because corruption prevails, impunity prevails. Uh, as far as those concessions go, uh, there is no due process uh, applied to those situations. So there is a resistance and struggles faced in 
with this criminalization. And that is where the Honduran army is involved in the murder of our, 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 our comrade, Berta Cáceres. And so we know that this points towards uh, the impunity in this case that exists in our country. Therefore, we think it is important to make several suggestions where we must uh, point uh, towards uh, the, the fact that this death should not remain uh, in impunity. We think that it's important to have an independent commission to clarify the crime of this murder. Who paid for it? Who carried it out? That is important for us, and we think there should be an independent commission established where the Honduran state should should call the the, the HIC to call independent experts to get to the source of this murder. I also think it's important that anything has to do with uh, economic support that is given to Honduras for police or armed forces. We have to point that out so that we can halt the murders because we believe that they will continue because the threats towards Copin, the threats towards Berta's family, uh, threats to each one of us are there all the time. So it is important that we should see what we're going to do to be able to stop this whole uh, topic of privatization, which is one of, one of the, 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 the leading points that we think is important. Because in Honduras, all this privatization is going to the pillage of our territories and the pillage of our common goods of, of, uh, of nature, of our spirituality as Lenka people, and it also generates a genocide towards our people. This is systematic genocide because we are exterminated, we are threatened, we are murdered, and our sources are taken away. And the, the source is the access to land so that we can plant corn and beans and all, all our harvests that we have in, within our communities. That's why we think it is important for us to participate in this space. For us, it is important, really, so that, uh, that we may mention and see what actions can be taken or, or uh, in f to, to support human rights and in favor of our people. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And it certainly raises a question that if people don't have a livelihood in Honduras, where will they end up coming? So for those in the U.S. who are worried about immigration, I think the point about Yemen, people just want to be home, is really, really important. Thank you very much, Thomas. Um, Professor Radhika Balakrishnan. Radhika, you know, earthquakes and tsunamis are generally natural disasters. War and poverty are man-made disasters. So what's our answer to trying to, to unmake them? So if they're man-made, can we unmake them? Um, and what's the... Is there an overarching sort of challenge and approach that we need to take globally? Uh, you have, you're a professor at uh, Rutgers and you are the author, co-author of Rethinking Economic Policy for Social Justice, um, the radical potential of human rights. So the floor is yours to tell us what it is that we need to be reaching for. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, <clears throat> I have to say it's such an honor, uh, President Carter. Um, the first time I was able to vote in the United States as a U.S. citizen, I voted for you. So, <laughs> <clears throat> um, Going back to your legacy as president, um, you signed three very important human rights agreements. Only one has been ratified, but you've signed three. And, and I want to go back to that in terms of thinking about the legacy of, of human rights. I mean, we talk about human rights often. And, and way too often, we talk about human rights only in its violation. We wait for a violation of human rights and then say, we need to go and look at why it was violated. And 
I would argue that we actually need to use human rights, and especially the International Covenant on Economic and Social Rights that you, you signed in conjunction with the civil and political rights and the Convention Against Discrimination Against Women as three interconnected uh, human rights instruments that actually give us something to think about economic policy. Sanam, you talked about the, the um, you know, 68 billionaires compared to 388 a few years ago. We talk about um, the, the violation of uh, indigenous land. All of that seems incredibly huge issue to deal with. But what we need to do is to really shift the normative framework by which we look at economic policy. And, and we can talk about extreme capitalism, we could, I mean, we can call it whatever it is, but I think it's very clear in the world right now that there needs to be a shift. And that shift has to be a normative shift. And I think many people uh, brought up the, the question that I'd asked uh, two days ago, what is this economy for? Why do we participate in this economy? What is its purpose? And we've sort of given up that, that question, assuming that it is for GDP growth, and then at some point it will trickle down, and then we'll all benefit. But I think we need to go back to that very basic question. What is this economy for, and why do we participate in it? Right? We're all participants in that economy. And so what I would urge uh, is, why don't we now assess the economy in terms of the normative framework of human rights. Let's not wait for its violation to decide that there's something that needs to be fixed, but why don't we actually audit economic policy from a human rights perspective? And this is the work that I've been doing for the last 10 years, so I'm, I'm definitely convinced that it's the right way to go. Um, but I think, um, President Carter, you talked about the social contract. The social contract the economy is an integral part of that social contract. And I think we haven't really interrogated that aspect of the social contract enough in, in recent years. And we need to go back to that. I mean, theorists have always talked about the social contract. I think someone said Adam Smith had talked about the role of, of, of the social contract. But we, and we don't have to make up new rules. We already have those rules in the human rights instruments. And the fact that, that they were signed together purports to the indivisibility of both civil and political and economic and social rights. I mean, if you can't read, how are you going to know who you're voting for? And so we often emphasize only the civil and political rights, especially from the West, but the economic and social rights are integral to, to that um, uh, issue. Uh, we're looking at extreme levels of poverty around the world. I mean, and, and poverty in the richest country in the world. I mean, in the United States, the, the levels of poverty are unfathomable. I mean, people, um, I come from India originally, and, and people don't even understand. It's like, how could you have this levels of poverty in the richest country in the world? And so we need to look at that extreme poverty. We have uh, unprecedented levels of inequality, both inside nations and between nations, which really address issues of power imbalance in terms of decision-making powers. Mainstream economic policy that still rules the roost in terms of policymaking keeps proposing GDP, you keep increasing GDP and something will fall out. And, and, uh, and, and mainstream economic theory is, I think someone said before, winners will compensate the losers. Well, we're still waiting for that compensation. It hasn't happened, but we need to, we need to look at not that compensation, but what are the premises of that economic policy making? It's GDP growth and inflation low, and those are the only two reasons for economic policy making, so how do we, how do, we do that? We need to rethink economic policy from the normative framework. And I want to give, uh, in the two minutes I have left, two very concrete examples of where we could use human rights as a way to assess economic policy. I had done uh, a project um, before that looked at the US and Mexico in terms of economic policy and human rights. And one of the things that we found when we looked at NAFTA and the implementation of the North American Free Trade Agreement is that the Mexican Constitution had to be changed in order to accommodate NAFTA, rather than NAFTA being changed to accommodate the Mexican Constitution. And the, the 
precise aspects of change that the Mexican Constitution had to, uh, the, the ways in which the Mexican Constitution had to be changed has so much to do with what Tomas is saying. It was about communal land, it was about access and ownership of communal land by indigenous communities, and those were privatized. Those then have minerals in it that are now being exploited by, by multinational corporations. People are being assassinated who are trying to protect that land. But the fact that there was not an a human rights audit of a trade agreement, that would have prevented this from happening. And so how do we make human rights something not that we don't wait for the violation to then claim human rights, but have it be the normative framework that deals with the, one of the most important things that runs the world, which is economic policy. And the second example is uh, our, our, our colleague from Uganda talked about the right to education. Now, if our economic policies were built on the right to education, the right to health, the right to food, the right to an adequate standard of living, that being the, the, the framework by which you build economic policy, the girls would not be charged $5 to go to school. Uh, access to, to education would be the primary goal of economic policy. It doesn't mean that you don't have to have profits or that you have to have uh, some other kind, and, and it might be definitely the role of the state would be much bigger, but if your premise is that these basic human rights are the principle by which economic policy is made, then you would have a different kind of economic policy making and we then could hold our governments to account. And the one last thing, I know I've run out of time. Uh, I think the principle of participation, transparency and accountability, something that's very central to human rights in terms of all the decisions made, is never applied to economic policy. Do we know what kind of economic decisions are made and why? Who are the economists sitting in the room? They don't look like me. Uh, why are they made? And, and I think in terms of, and, and the last thing is in terms of kind of the role of finance these days, which is sort of running the world, we don't have the regulatory framework to hold that in. And that is something that we need as part of transparency, participation, and accountability in terms of economic policy making. I think you both pointed out a couple of things which are really interesting. One is that um, both traditional cultures had a way of looking after people, right? And we're losing that, that aspect of it, which is really important. It's almost like we're getting the worst of that world and the worst of the modern world. So that's one thing. And then, and then the fact that, as you say, the, the human rights framework exists. And 30, 40 years ago, life it didn't used to be. This disparity didn't exist. We've forgotten that. that you know, this is, this is something that's really just been around to this extent since the 1980s, I think. Um, I wanted to open the floor and uh, put your, please put your name cards up. We have, we have already a list of people. And um, I wanted to go to my colleagues from uh, Pakistan, Masrat Qadim and Shafqat Mahmoud, who are working together. You, you have been running the most incredible programs on de-radicalizing and rehabilitating both young men who've joined Talib, but also their mothers and, and having a community um, effect. So I'm not sure which one of you wants to go first. Um, it's, I, maybe Shafqat Mahmoud would go. But Shafqat, talk to us a little bit about what it's like to be at the receiving end of international assistance and development aid and all the money that we are told, our tax dollars that we're supposedly told comes to you, but somehow between starting from us and starting to you, it seems to go somewhere else. <laughs> it sort of seems to disappear a lot of it. So, so what's it like to be at the receiving end? And are there good practices and bad practices that, that you, you encounter? Thank you. Uh, first of all, I would just like to say, uh, I'm uh, honored to be here. And I would just like to tell you, uh, just a second, yes? Uh, uh, Mr. President, that you have been the most popular president in my country. <laughs> because you never took up drones and you never supported Saudi Arabia and you never did those things which today people talk against America and my country. 
So I think it's a great honor to be in, under this roof sitting with you. Uh, regarding the projects uh, which uh, Sanam has just asked, uh, I would just like to say that uh, in the past 12 to 13 years, and I've made this organization along with Musrat, and we've been working on this. We have done about 86 projects so far. And uh, as we look into it, that we have been having projects from the uh, embassies, with the donors, with the government, as well as uh, with the INGOs. But we were never comfortable. We had so many uh, problems with all these uh, people with the strong um, uh, direction, with strong restrictions, with strong reservations. Uh, but for a person like me, who is a designer also, programmer also, and by virtue of the fact that I, the organization is my own, I've been part of the implementation as well as, in particular, de-radicalization process. So on that account, I always looked for a type of a project or type of money flow or type of support which should be free of bureaucratic channels, which should be uh, supportive down to the person who's going to get that benefit. Now, we have been working uh, with those Talibans who were to be de-radicalized. We've been working with uh, uh, women and mothers of the extremists. I think they required that money which should, should have gone down and should have helped us. And we realized that uh, Unless a project which hasn't got the impact, a cost-benefit analysis through that, if it hasn't got an impact, uh, a project which cannot be replicated, a uh, money which cannot expand the future in that case, a money which does not, uh, money which cannot guarantee sustainability uh, within the uh, project um, um, uh, after the project cycle. So, when we look at all this, like uh, as a planner, I think. I can give one solid example of a uh, case, and unluckily or luckily, um, uh, Sanam is sitting here. It was actually a project which was uh, for five, six countries, and we were part of that. Uh, it is just the positive points I would like to highlight. It was built on the understanding of the context and, and the cultural understanding of my country. It was not, not driven by any donor. It was built on the trust in which the capacity of the organization was seen, that they can have, do they have the capacity to link with the communities and do the work which they want. I think that trust was very important. It had no bureaucratic, um, um, you can say, the reins. It was very clear, very flexible. And other, like other contingency planning, we were even, uh, it was possible for us to even deviate with a view to get the best impact out. And I tell you, I, I here commit in front of you that almost over $20 million projects we have done. One small project we did with ICANN, the result, the impact was many fold within six hundred uh, within $100,000 as compared to those dollars which we have spent with the other donors. The reason had been the trust, the mutual understanding, we're joining in from planning till end, as well as giving us the flexibility to do it. And in that, I would like to tell you to what has happened. Just a small uh, example, that those extremists whom we de-radicalized, we gave them money out of the same project. And they did the mobilization, and they did the de-radicalization part. And the result was that they were able to uh, mobilize or de-radicalize hundreds of other um, Talibans, and they were actually um, uh, they joined hands and they started preaching for peace, started preaching for human rights in an areas where human right and a woman right has got no bearing. You have to have a, um, you have to sign in in the in, in the uh, in the mosque. You have to pay for if you are absent for one prayer. You have to pay for that. If you have a if you have a car radio player in your car, you have to pay a fine for that. That was the area where we've been working, but it has now changed by virtue of this one single good example and the best practice. I would say that. Thank you very much. But before I finish off with this, uh, sir, you had mentioned about Pakistan and India. They always have been at the nuclear threshold, and today. Sitting over here, we commit, my Indian friend is also there, and we are two, of, two Indians and two Pakistanis, we commit that we'll take your message to the Pakistani government 
to to make sure that this nuclear escalation does not take place and we disarm them thank you sir Thank you very much. Masrad, would you like to speak now or do you want me to do others or do you just want to add quickly to, yes, yes. Yeah, no, no, and I'll come back to you if that's, if that's okay. Um, I have on my list uh, Sylvie. Sylvie. Sylvie, where is she? Oh, there we go. The floor is yours. And please introduce yourselves. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much for uh, letting me uh, talk. Uh, my name is Sylvie Kinigi. I come from Burundi. Uh, I'm on uh, the right of uh, President Carter. I'm very happy to be here. I come from a very small country that a lot of people don't know, but right now we are talking about our country because of the gravity of the crimes that are happening in my country because of the uh, ramification, the effect that we are observing into the region, which can touch the world maybe. Uh, a small country that unfortunately uh, had uh, created hope uh, in, uh, in human rights. Uh, I am saying that because I, have, I was prime minister in a government that was just elected in a democratic way in 1993, and I was the first woman in Burundi, but also in Africa, uh, to be prime minister. And I was so proud of these people, and today I cry for these people. Unfortunately, those conflicts have very deep roots. Uh, when I was uh, called to be prime minister, three months later, uh, we killed our president. He was pushed to... Uh, to be there during massacres and during uh, crimes that were due by a coup that were going against democracy. And at that time, I, I, wanted, I want to, to speak, I want to tell you about what happened, even if it takes a little bit of time, please let me, uh, allow me, uh, I'm going to explain to you why. I was prime minister, I was pushed uh, out when they uh, figured out that there was a, a prime minister, there was a woman that were against their objectives, uh, those military said, why didn't we kill her? Because, uh, as a prime minister, even if the prime, if, even if the president just died, I represented the democracy, the democratic process, and 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 there was a, the, the, it, it was just the promise that we had. We 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 went there. We were able to counter the coup, but the coup that 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 just happened and had massacres and and at this time. I was not even uh, supported by my political party when that happened after the coup. And at one point, I was wondering, it's like uh, heaven and, and the earth just came against me. And, and I told myself, I have to protect my children. I have small, I had small children. I called my brother, please take my children. I cannot go hide, but you have to hide my children because the military can come over and, and, and try, and they tried, but I was naked because of God. I and somebody was saying uh, uh, yesterday, the day before yesterday, that if we favor the promotion of women, the, the women to be a head of state that are in the government, there would be less wars. And Without saying, I believe that too. I believe that when a mother is uh, uh, faced to by conflict, she first think to save her children because she's a mother first. Merci. Merci bien. 
Ils pensent à protéger. Je me souviens. We, we, que they think of protecting. Ah, and I remember that later, uh, unfortunately, when the massacre started, I had uh, opened the door for the uh, courage of women, women who went in the streets to demonstrate against war. And some women within their message were saying this is the time where we would wish to hide our children in, in our blood inside of us. We cannot do that. We, but we are screaming to have peace and they were able to shut down the weapons, to shut off the weapons. And it is within this small country that despite all the calls of the, the efforts of the international community, the conflicts continued later on. In 2000, we were able to organize a dialogue between, between adversaries that once again women were together and they were uh, uh, being refused to participate to the dialogue but were able to get together to impose their presence and I can tell you that it's because it's because the women who advocated from Burundi that the resolution 1325 was adopted in the United Nations. I can tell you that it's because of these women and I wanted to have this message come through today. But uh, today, uh, what happens in Burundi, it's what's happening in Syria. With the difference is that today, the Burundi's pr president is using uh, the army is using uh, the militia, uh, militia uh, and with the silence of some of the uh, uh, country with unfortunately uh, the impossibility of the United Nation of the African Union to stop his ambition. He continues to kill and the genocide is happening and if today Somewhere, I'm, I'm, I'm telling myself, is there a psalm, a psalm that says, when everything falls down, what can the just do? I have a tendency to be pessimistic, but by being here, I'm trying to hope that it's the hope we cannot, we don't have the right to despair. And, and excuse me, uh, but I would wish to, to tell you, and I, I thank you, President Carter, I, I want to call out to the people who are here to advocate for human rights get together for this movement, for, but, but make things, move things, S uh, be sure that those autocratic power are, that are killing could, we can give power, we can give hope, because we are parents, we are mother, if we don't scream uh, a future, our will, our wish, our dream, it's to build a future for another generation, and we have to keep on that message. I'm going to I'm going to ask our speakers please to keep it relatively short because that way we can hear many voices and and I understand that there are many many stories and many many urgent issues but just to keep it as short as you can I'm going to ca ca move along to uh, Kathy Robinson Kathy tell us about the work that you do on US military budget issues and how it can be dealt with thank you Thank you Sanam and Thank you, President Carter. You're such a blessing to this country and to, to the whole globe. It is amazing. I work with Women's Action for New Directions, and the new directions that we seek are peace and prosperity, directions that take us away from war and weapons. And we look a lot at the federal budget, and what we've seen year after year is the machinery of war, the Pentagon, taking up um, over half, well over half, of what our Congress votes on to appropriate each year. And what's left for everything else are tiny pieces of the budget pie. 
tiny pieces of the budget pie for education, for health care, for safe rails, roads, and bridges, for Zika protection, and only 4% for development and diplomacy around the world for those programs that we need that are really prevention programs for war and, and violence. Uh, these priorities do not really reflect the values of most American taxpayers. And they're dangerous. One of the particular ways that this budget is dangerous is the amount of money that we're spending on nuclear weapons. And you mentioned in your opening remarks that we are planning to spend a trillion dollars developing the next generation of nuclear weapons. I agree with Sylvia that we ought to be investing this money in the next generation of humans instead. Um, and I wanted to particularly thank a colleague uh, from Pakistan for making this commitment to move forward um, with our colleague from India in saying no to this new nuclear arms race. And I hope that the United States will say no to that as well. Thank you, Kathy. The idea of investing in humans instead of bombs, it seems simple enough, right? Um, I'm going to ask Professor Wang, I'm just, where? Oh, there you are. Thank you, your, your card was down. Um, floor is yours. Thank you. I would like to use this opportunity, first of all, could you just, uh, to- Could you just turn off your, um, translating your things because it's, it's uh, somebody's is on. If yeah. it, especially if it's close to a mic that's on. Okay. The person who's speaking. Oh, okay. Uh, first of all, I would like to use the opportunity to express my gratitude to President Carter. Uh, years ago, because of President Carter's work with Deng Xiaoping's administration, that Chinese government uh, changed the policy and allowed the Chinese students to go abroad to study. And the U.S. universities accepted a lot of Chinese students. I was one of them, and I came here in 1985, and I finished my master's degree and a PhD, both in University of California, and now I'm a professor of women's studies and uh, history at the University of Michigan. Uh, but my gratitude was not just say that, oh, I have uh, smooth career development. No, my goal was not for my personal uh, career development. I still keep my Chinese passport. I'm still a Chinese citizen because I saw that agreement to allow Chinese students to come here is a way to promote world peace by enhance cultural understandings. So I remember that, I regard that as my mission. So basically, after I got my PhD, I commute between the two countries. I established a, a collaboration between uh, University of Michigan and the Chinese universities. And I have devoted uh, myself to promoting women's and gender studies and transforming cultural uh, product, knowledge production in China, uh, transforming curriculums in higher education. Okay, so that is to express that uh, uh, my, my experience and my other Chinese students' uh, uh, gratitude to President Carter's work. Uh, but most importantly, I want to use this opportunity to introduce a not insignificant dimension in our discussion of global peace. Um, as we all know that China has rapidly uh, risen to the number two world power, economic power, GDP number two next to the United States. Uh, as a Chinese citizen, for a long time, I have wished that China's increasing economic power would not be translated into military power. But unfortunately, in the past decade especially, we see that the current leadership manifested a masculinist desire for power and domination. And as a result, we see that uh, both 
the, uh, 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 the declining of uh, human rights in China, and increasing political control domestically, and uh, expansion of military power in the world, and economic power as well. So this kind of situation, um, I don't know how many people in the world have been paying attention, but I really think I want to use this opportunity of this uh, meeting of global communities that we need to pay attention to this rising uh, economic giants and what's the direction it wants to turn to. And we Ch Chinese has an idiom saying that money can make devils grind, to push the grind for you. So uh, today we see in the world, in English is money talks. And we did see that in different countries that obviously uh, everybody needs Chinese money, even including the United States, right? <laughs> So that reduced the bargaining power and political power of the US in this very strong uh, economic power of China. So I would suggest that Carter Center uh, would pay more attention to the changing situation of China and its, in, its uh, implications to the global peace. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Wang. We, we have an expression, of course, in English, which is that put your money where your mouth is. I think that this forum, we're trying to say we want to put our mouth where our money is as taxpayers in the United States. So, so it's, it's shifting the balance a little bit. Uh, um, Stella Duke from Colombia. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Muchas gracias. Yo quiero disculparme porque voy a cambiar un poco el tema. I want to apologize because I have to um, accomplish a mission, a mission that have been given by the children of Colombia, and is to tell you thank you, thank you, Mr. President Carter, for being in the present in the peace process. Together with your team, with the people that represent the center, we have been able to produce this protocol that will allow the children will leave the conflict, the armed conflict in Colombia. So thank you for that hope. Thank you for that possibility. I hope that on June 23rd, we will have a positive answer because it's been your voice, your presence, and your team's presence that has allowed us in the Havana to come to this agreement. And that soon, many of the children that were involved in the war would go back home, would go back to their families. So thank you for the hope. Children have given me a task this is our symbol. This little comet that I have, they knitted it for you. And they asked me that you would wear it on June 23rd when they signed the agreement. Would you please wear it and send them a picture with it? That's their wish. And three of the girls that came out of the conflict who lived the violence. Today, they are including this. They did these cards for you. And they asked me, with lots of love, to tell you thank you. Thank you and all of those who worked with you. So this is for you. Thank you again. Thank you for the hope and may your voice will always be with us in Colombia. Thank you. Next on my list is uh, Fatima Fera. Feka, sorry. Sorry, my eyes are really bad. <laughs> it's okay, so am I. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm fine. So the, yeah? Okay, wait, can you wait oh. until we, let's do this real quick. Oh, okay.
Hi, everyone. My name is Fatmira Feka. I think I'm the only Europe, Eastern European here. I'm from Kosovo. It is an honor to be here, especially to meet President Carter, uh, because you're the only one left that I really wanted to meet. I, sh I shook his hand and he gave me a kiss, but I need a picture too. <laughs> So I'm the founder of the Kids for Peace movement. It's amazing that Stella set the stage for me because I truly believe in children. And when I started the Kids for Peace movement in Kosovo, I participated in a conference where Muslim leaders were there. And one of the leaders told me that you can't be a leader. And I was like, what? He said, first, because in order to be a leader, you have to speak loud. And in order to be a leader, you have to be a man. And I said, well, let me think about that. He actually discouraged me, but here you go. In 2005, I was nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize. It's an honor. I did not win, but it's still, it's, I'm in a good path, I think. We got nominated, uh, we won the Angel of Hope Prize. We've expanded our movement, and that's because I'm a woman. And I told now everyone that I don't have to be a man to speak loud. I can speak loud. You just have to be willing to listen to what I have to say. I can make a difference. You just, I just need your help. And I'm not discouraging men here by all means because I cannot do alone what I'm doing. Together, we can make this world a better place. And I think Mr. Carter, President Carter has had a great example. So all of you, so thank you for letting me participate in this conference, and I need a picture from you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> President Carter, would you like to respond to, or do you want to? <laughs> You're happy listening. Yeah, I mean, okay, sure. Okay, so next on my list is Sister Tracy. Oh, yes, I'm gonna come to Mosarat in a, but I'm gonna go to Tracy, to, to Sister, to Reverend Tracy Blackman, who, awed us the other day, and I'm sure we'll do so again today. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to speak, um, and thank you for this great honor, President Carter. Uh, you are my hero, and I have a very short list. <laughs> there is a West African proverb that says, until the lion can tell its story, the hunter will always be the hero. I am very clear that I am only in this room because I come to represent the lion. And the lions are many more than the hunters. I'm intrigued by this conversation about the global impact of economics, but I caution us not to forget that we have some severe economic challenges here in the United States. I caution us not to forget that we are a country where many, many children go to bed hungry every night in a country where food is not scarce. And I caution us not to forget that one of the many things that does not get reported about Ferguson, which is where people began to hear my name, is that many of the people who stayed in the streets in Ferguson, many of the young people who stayed in the streets in Ferguson, stayed in the streets 24 hours because the street is where they lived. Because they didn't have homes and shelter. And where at the height of the unrest in Ferguson, when our streets were militarized, at a cost of $3.8 million for three days. These very same streets were homes to children whose schools were unaccredited. Homes to children who could not get to school and whose only meals were provided at school. The United States does a great job of presenting ourselves as the power. But I caution us, and I'm so grateful to you for this platform, to remember that how we treat our brothers and sisters here matters. And I suggest to you that at the core of this despair in the United States of America 
is the evil sin that we have not dealt with, which is racism. And racism manifests itself in poverty, in homelessness, in profit prisons, in legal systems that draw its wealth off of the poor. And as we fight all around the globe, we also have to fight here. Thank you. We're going back and forth between different countries, but there's a universality to what the message is, which is if we invest in people and if we trust our local actors, things can really be different. Mosarat, talk to us about your experiences dealing with the militarized world that you're living in. Thank you. I thought I will be talking of something very general. Thank you, Sanam, and thank you, uh, President Carter, for giving us the space to talk our hearts out. Um, and I have to actually say one thing very personal. I wrote my first, like, you know, a master's degree thesis on Pakistan-U.S. relations, Carter administration. So, <laughs> and I taught that for 13 years also. Um, I want to actually flag uh, three points um, regarding the economy of peace. The first thing is, I believe that the architects of this global economic order or system or policy, whatever we call it, are least interested in three things, human rights, peace, and countering violent extremism. My second uh, point is that the extremists are getting funding on daily basis, on continuous basis. What is the source of funding? Have we ever thought of it? And on the other side, people who are working to address this issue of violent extremism, to counter and prevent violent extremism at different levels, they are facing limited uh, limitations when it comes to funding, when it comes to resources. We have never thought of it. We have never addressed this issue. So it means those architects of this global economic order are least pushed about violent extremism, about atrocities, about conflict, about these different, I think, uh, issues that are, we, we are being facing on a daily basis. And the third really important point, and that is my experience, while working with the people on ground who were extremists, uh, who had a lot of issues, psychological, ideological, political, and social, and also with the women who were marginalized, who had, who were, who had never seen the outside world. But when it comes to economic empowerment, we saw those women coming out of the houses those women really getting the, the strength to talk not only to their very extremist sons, but to their communities. And then they were well received. They were well recognized for their efforts. So in my belief, actually economic empowerment is antidote to violent extremism. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Masarat. And you should point out that President Carter, the bags were made by those mothers, by the way. So that's <laughs> These bags are actually being made by those women who are the, the mothers of extremists. And through this economic empowerment, they really not only, and this is the most conservative area of, of Pakistan, the Khabar Pukhtun and Fata. Those women are not only actually taking back some money to their homes, but also providing for the education of the children. And also, because of this money that they take back home, now they have a say in the decision making at home and in the community. Okay, um, thank you. Um, Kathleen Keenis, the floor is yours, and you're closing the session for us, so thank you. Thank you very much, and I will do this very briefly. I'm an anthropologist, and as anthropologists, we look at things and we look for auspicious events. 
And I'd like to suggest to you that today we are witnessing one of them in the house that President Carter built. <laughs> it is the summer solstice. It is the longest day of the year. And in traditional pagan beliefs, it is the day when the veil between the human world and the spirit world is at its thinnest, when we can speak across those two worlds. And not only is it the solstice, but it is also the full moon. And the last time the summer solstice and the full moon coincided like today was in 1948. That is 68 wow. years ago. And so I would like to suggest that the power of light is with us, not only with the long day, but the very full moon. <laughs> it was Martin Luther King who said that those who love peace must learn to organize as well as those who love war. And I live by this saying. It is time to change our human narrative of peace to be as provocative, as hard hitting, and as engaging as the narrative of violence. I live this narrative of peace in my work. I work for an institution that receives about 35 million a year dedicated to ending world violence. Across the way, across the river, is another institution that received $58 billion this year in the interests of ending violence through violence. And so I come to you today, I thank you President Carter and all of the many colleagues in this moment of light because we can change the narrative of peace. Thank you. Thank you. On that note. Thank you, perfect way to, to bring us to our, our break. We will. Um, Rejoin um, in the room where we met. We will be eating, having dinner there at five o'clock. Thank you for a wonderful day. Uh, enjoy your dinner conversation. And um, you okay? And make sure that those of you who have uh, seat assignments, can you please um, rush to your, your tables now so we can get started right at five. Thank you. Thank you.